All right, hello and welcome to the latest session in our Masterclass speaker series. Um, normally something we'd do in the summer, we did so last year, had some really great feedback, but lots of demand to bring them back early this year. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have a guest on today, Alfonso Picatiello. He has joined me, as you can see here. A um, bit of an introduction. We're gonna, he's going to go into it himself in more detail in a moment, but um, he is the author of the absolutely amazing Macro Compass. If you're not reading that already, you should. Definitely, I'll drop the link to everyone for that uh, going forward. But he was previously the head of investment portfolio at the Treasury Department of ING Germany, where he was in charge of active management of around $20 billion of a multi-asset portfolio. So a guy of immense uh, exposure and experience. And as we will hear about in a moment, he's not that old either. So it's going to be really fascinating to see that journey of progression um, over that, that period of coming out of study. And so the way we're going to kind of divide this session up is Alf and I are going to have a chat. We're going to pivot around two areas. One, and I know we've already just said this off camera, is we talk to so many industry people, but students very... Uh, not very regularly know the real background or personal story of these people that they look and aspire to be. And so it's going to be great to, to have a chat about that, go back in time a little bit. So we'll talk about that in the first section, and then we'll pivot and talk a little bit more about your, your specialism. I think Eddie said as well earlier that, you know, you're kind of a, a macro guru, and it'll be great for students, I think, to have macro in a digestible way that's going to be useful for them for I guess the pursuit of landing a role in finance so yeah kind of away from perhaps some of the te technicalities and a little bit more about how do they kind of deconstruct what's going on so that they can think better when they're interviewing and things of that nature and then we'll do a Q&A at the end so without further ado um, Alf great to have you with us and okay. um, yeah it'd be, it'd be awesome to know a little bit about you really <laughs> your background and how you got sure. started going back to kind of school days I guess so first of all, congrats for uh, the amazing work you do with Amplify and uh, you know what, what you guys have built. It's really nice. And I'm honored to be here and speak to, um, to students. I mean, to young guys. I call them students, but ultimately young guys. So I'm a, a 30 years old, looking 50, but still 30 years old guy um, who uh, comes from a humble place in the south of Italy where GDP per capita is, I don't know, $15,000 a year. I mean, if you make a thousand euro a month, you're paid very well. If you manage to get a job, there is about 40% youth unemployment rate where I come from. It's a very tough place, um, very humble place, but also a very um, intense, like emotionally intense one. Uh, it's the South of Italy. So it, there is a lot of that going on there, but it's a great learning experience when you grow up because you learn to grind literally like you you have to to go that extra mile because there is so much uh, uncertainty uh, i talked about youth unemployment rate before right so there is no there is a queue of people applying for jobs uh, in that region compared to the availability of jobs out there right so there is this imbalance which makes it very difficult which motivates people to go the extra mile and that's well as i was basically raised and thanks a lot as well to the fact that my mother runs the treasury department of a small bank in, in the south of Italy, very small bank, but uh, she's very passionate. It's a typical uh, southern Italian woman, I would say. And so I was, I was basically brought into the world of finance already when I was 14, because at lunch breaks uh, after school, uh, my mom was there too, but she was in, in her lunch break from, from work. And she was still looking at these charts, you know, this is futures, these equities, these bonds. And I'm like, what the heck is that? I mean, I'm eating my pasta here and I can't talk to you because you're looking at whatever, the US markets or whatever you're trading, right? And so I, I just, I was very curious, which is uh, something we're going to talk about later. And it really helps in shaping your career, guys. And that helped me because I just wanted to know what she was looking at. And then I started liking it because ultimately this is a puzzle. Markets are a puzzle. The macroeconomy is a puzzle that you need to sort of assemble together. And yeah, from there, I developed this passion, pursued it at, at uh, university and uh, read a gazillion books uh, that I, I mean, I was just too curious, to be honest. And, and that's what really helped me. 
and then uh well basically from there we we can we can discuss what happened but i think also the university experience was an interesting one that taught me a lot but i'm gonna stop here anthony if you have questions or yeah i mean with with um university then so given the fact that you came into this with already like an interest in trading and things like that how did you find what you learned at university to satisfy satisfy that kind of itch I mean, was it was it kind of like a necessary passage to get where you wanted to go? Or did you actually find that actually was useful then for when you were getting mm. to those first steps into, into your career? So I found it relatively useful because I was lucky to have exposure to two different teaching models. So I studied macroeconomics at my bachelor degree uh, in, uh, well, basically close to my hometown. And then for my master of, uh, uh, master of Science, I moved to uh, the north of Italy, where I did a Master of Science in English that really, of course, helped broaden my skills. And, well, we Italians are not very well known to speak fluent English. So <laughs> there was also something I needed to work on back then. Still probably need to with my Al Pacino <laughs> accent. But I, I can't do much about that. Anyway, um, and when I went there, the course was quantitative finance, which meant that I had a lot of math and statistics and econometrics and all of that. But so I learned a ton about, uh, let's say, the quant side of finance, although some of it was not really applicable or concretely applicable, but it, it gave you that mindset. You, you understand what a linear regression is. You understand what a stochastic process is. It doesn't mean you will be a master in, in handling those things in your life, but at least you get a good understanding of the big picture. What are we trying to do with this quant stuff? Uh, what, I, what, what, what that experience lacked is the applicability. So we, we very rarely used to say, okay, we are going to use this regression to try and test a or backtest a trading model, for instance. It was rather non-applied quant stuff. Yeah, I was lucky then to win a scholarship and go at the European Business School to finish my master's degree. That's in Germany. It's a private university that obviously I can't afford, uh, but thanks to the scholarship I managed. And um, there, the teaching style was completely the opposite. So you walk in there after one year of quant finance stuff. And the first day, they just basically give you a case study uh, you know, you, you have to basically analyze the balance sheet of a company and tell what the company is going to, you know, do to improve its profitability or whatever was task. And I'm like, but there was no theory. I mean, how am I supposed to, to do something here? And so the German approach was completely different. And it, it was uh, rather than a, a bottom-up approach where you first start from, you know, the, 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 the basis of the theory and you work up your way until you're able to effectively put it in practice, if you ever even try, we moved to the opposite, which was, this is the problem. Try to figure out how to solve it. Give me your answer. And then we're going to cover the, the theory behind. And basically, I was lucky enough to experience both um, teaching methods. And as well, my, my brain got you know, used to think both ways. And I think this is a, a, a um, it's always good not to get your ego or your style attached to a certain type of student, type of guy. I am either a quant or a big thinker. I'm either a mathematician or a top-down consultant or whatever. Uh, this either or hardly benefits uh, you in your career. There are paths which are very specialist paths, but even in this specialism, guys, you will have to have a diverse set of, of skills. In nowadays labor market, it's basically impossible to be able to have just one skill. And even if you are the top two, three percentile at that skill, you will be required to, to have a broad set of skills. So try to diversify as well the approach you have to learning. Uh, what, were you, what were you like at that stage in your life? Were you mm. quite an introvert? Were you an extrovert? Were you able, because like, I guess operating in a professional sense isn't just about having technical capabilities Absolutely you're in an organization not. right and no. there's lots of other things that come along with that no so let's let's go into the the, the working uh career so basically i i from the master of science in germany um ing which was the bank i was working for until a few months ago 
uh, came on campus and started, you know, asking guys and interviewing. There were them and then Barclays and then whoever else, Big Bang was in there trying to recruit basically interns. And so I had a chat with them and they were growing like hell. So ING is a Dutch bank and they were growing in Germany. They were setting up shop in Germany 2013, something like that, 2014. And so I decided to join a department which actually wasn't even what I was looking for. I knew that already. So I was a markets guy, always fascinated by macroeconomics and markets. And I ended up joining the commercial bank side. They were, they were basically setting up their commercial bank to lend basically to German businesses. And so obviously I tried to, took the, to take the, the markets rated stuff. So pricing the loans, calculating risks and all of that within that internship. But again, the grinding mentality worked back then too, because what I really needed, Anthony, is to get my feet through the door. And I don't care if it, the first job is not going to be the good one. I'm still going to learn something because I, I have no idea what I'm doing here. So, and, and ultimately it's going to be a good experience. That was my mindset back then. And so it, it worked exactly like that. So I learned quite a few things during my internship, but after four months, the thing that I learned by far being the most valuable was networking. So I, I immediately realized that I had a lot of people around me, directors, managing directors, and you know, you, you just have to, to speak to them. And ultimately, something will pop up uh, that will interest you or could be an opportunity. Mm. And then, well, basically, ultimately, that's what happened. And uh, a job in the treasury department of ING the Netherlands, which is the headquarters, it's a Dutch bank, right, opened up. And the treasury department was basically the place where I wanted to end up in financial markets, right, where you, you effectively run portfolios, manage risks, and... Um, trade different asset classes, which is, you know, you basically try to solve the puzzle, you get your hands dirty into what I always wanted to do, but it was not nearly this fairy tale linear path up. It was a lot of grinding, a lot of, you know, trying to broaden your skill sets, even the ones, even the skill set you really don't think it's necessary or you hate, it, it, it can re really help. Yeah, I think what... Uh... It, it almost answers the question, but to put it out there anyway, because we always focus on obtaining that first job and getting that first foot in the door. But I think for a lot of students, because they have that such a mountain of an objective, they get there and then they can feel a bit lost then because they've lost that. That was a very clear, definable goal. Yeah. And then once they're in the organization, it's like, oh, it's almost like the air's let out a little bit and you're like, you need to re-motivate. Mm -hmm. um, so any, any advice around those who have secured and they're in that first infancy of their career? Or is it, again, it's just utilizing that network and really growing off other people's experience and expertise? The advice I can give is you assume you sleep eight hours a day, you have 24 hours in your day, then you have 16 left, then you have to eat and take care of yourself. You have maybe 13, 14 hours left. Between commute, well, nowadays not that much, but normally speaking, between commute and the hours you're going to put in, you're probably going to spend about 70% of your awake time doing this. This equals your job, which can be setting up your company, working for an employer, whatever. It's at least 70% of your awake time. While at the beginning of your career, this might not even seem a metric you will focus on, a few years later, you will focus on this. So the only one single advice I can give when you start the first two years of your career is just experiment. Literally means just try to find out what you like, because this will be by far the most important thing in defining how happy are you about your, your life, your, your working life. At the end of the day, if you're unhappy about what you do, you're never going to be able to either perform nor get the best out of it for yourself and for your employer. Well, if you have an employer and you don't run your own company, the most important thing is to find out what you like. And once you find that out, it's going to be such a revelation because then working is, is actually the verb is not going to describe exactly what you do. So as I always say, this before this was not my job working for the bank. It was my passion. It's just what I like to do. And then it doesn't weigh on your shoulders 
you don't wake up on a, on a Monday morning saying, holy crap, I need to face seven days or five days. You wake up saying, wow, that's cool. Let's see what happens today in markets. That was my thing. Your thing can be, I don't know, uh, let's run the accounting for this company or uh, let's set up my own company. Whatever it is, find what you like. That's by far the most important thing at the beginning of your career. Yeah, no, excellent advice. And yeah, that's the beauty I think I've always had in working on the market side is that every day is a new day and, <laughs> and every day is a new challenge, I guess. But um, okay, so m- moving this over to then the kind of next parts of the, the kind of discussion is that so I think it's a lot of mystique around what actually a portfolio manager does mm. for mm. students. So sure. it'd be great to actually get under the bonnet and for you to explain like what's a typical day look like? And I know it's not like guns blazing, you're making decisions left, right and center, but I yeah. guess a little bit of context would yes. be really great insight. Yes. So the day of a portfolio manager, um, not in, a, in an investment bank, let me add that because maybe the rhythm might be different. Um, is that you generally try to be at the office before the market opens, which means if you are in continental Europe, that's about 8, 8 8.15 a.m. So not not a prohibitive time. Um, And then you you, you run basically your, your, uh, you screen the news overnight because Asia has been trading in the meantime, uh, America from from last evening, if you were sleeping and whatever, right? So you understand what what has gone on. And then you move on into your positions. That's the most important thing. You're running positions at every point in time. Therefore, before the market opens, once you regroup your information, you have to understand whether there was any relevant vital information that changes your assessment of your portfolio. That's the first thing you do. And then uh, assuming you had no action to take because you still feel comfortable with your positions, you have a coffee, yes. Probably even before you even start. No, I'm just kidding. But... um, and from that point onwards, the market part, let's say, so both the executing and the thinking about strategies probably takes no more than 40% of your time. Yes, correct. 40%, not 80%, 40%. The remaining 60% is you have people annoying you. I'm just kidding. You have, you have a lot of things around you going on you need to manage which are not in the Wolf of Wall Street movie, but actually are there, which is your risk manager, which is your finance department that wants to make sure that the PL, the profit and loss, reconciles between what you see and what he or she sees on the back of the envelope when they run the ledgers and all the accounting softwares. And I can tell you 90% of the times you're not going to see the same numbers. So you, you have to argue a lot about that. Your risk manager will, will try to chase you and to basically bring down your positions at every single point in time. Even if you're making money, he doesn't care. His job is to basically make you shrink the amount of risk you take and optimize the profit and loss you make for one unit of risk. All right, so you'll have this very annoying guy basically <laughs> almost every day at your desk. And then uh, you'll have um, a lot of presentations to do and a lot of communication as well. So. I want to talk about that and another key part, which is the the stakeholder management, which is a very fancy word for uh, learn to be diplomatic. And uh, so if you are not diplomatic and you cannot do stakeholder management, you can be the best portfolio manager out there. You can only work for a hedge fund, maybe, because there the incentive scheme is 99% 99% make money, 1%, the rest is relevant. But if you work for a large institution, you can be the best portfolio manager out there if you cannot communicate what your strategy is. And if you cannot um, manage your stakeholders, you are not going to be successful. So the remaining 20, 25% of your time is communicating to stakeholders and managing them. And I le- at the beginning, I was paying zero attention to this. I mean, I walked in there and I'm like, okay, I have a strategy. I'm going to run it. I'm making money. Leave me alone. Oh, you have your, your, uh, I don't want to give presentations. Fuck off. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> you know, I just want to do this. I like it. Please leave me alone. Yeah. And, and my manager actually, you know, walked me in a room after a few months and he said, Alf, oh, your PL is looking very good and you definitely know what you're doing. I was back then not running a $20 billion portfolio, I was a junior 
um, basically an associate or even analyst back then, just, just started a year or two years after. I remember this conversation with him saying, nobody likes you. So uh, what are we going to do about that? And I'm like, what do you mean nobody likes me? It's like, but you don't, you don't want to talk about your strategy. You don't communicate it well. Uh, you don't pay attention to the presentations you're doing to stakeholders. And you tell your risk manager to, to go and have a walk. So that, that doesn't work. And so it, it, it was my wake up call basically to pay attention to communication and to stakeholder management. And up to today, Anthony, uh, now basically uh, writing the Macro Compass, which is an educational newsletter, effectively, with some investment ideas about global macro. The communication is at least 50% of uh, the success, because you can be the best content guy out there. If you're not able to convey your message out, it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, that's so important. And it's so important going back as well to what you said at the start about having different skills to complement and yeah. almost make the core ones better and like you say that fits perfectly with what you've just what you've spoken about so the, the question then next would be you obviously moved on from that role now to move on to new things tell me about that what was the rationale there and and, and what's the plan yeah so <laughs> We are at the analyst associate moment, right? A couple of years in, and they were promoting me year after year. My manager saw the PNL and also saw the, uh, the improvement I was making on communication and stakeholder management because I understood it was important. And then he said, okay, uh, I was 27 and a half. And he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you run a team of three people and a book of $20 billion. And I, I thought he was drunk, but he really did that. And... So at the beginning, that experience was, was incredible, right? And you get, and it's so hard. I mean, imagine managing a team of three Germans between 40 and 45 years old. <laughs> they have to be managed by a 27 and a half right. years. That's southern. a really good point. How did that go down? I mean. At the beginning, horrible. I mean, they're like, I don't recognize you. I, why you should be my boss. I mean, I, I see your p &L, but I mean, who, who the hell are you? I mean, so at the beginning, that was very tough. A great learning experience. Um, and then again, diplomacy and, and communication were more important than, than hard skills. Now that was fun for the first year and a half. And then I was 29, six years with ING. And in the last year I had zero fun. Fun for me means my learning curve was completely flat. And that is something I, I don't accept. I'm like, okay, I'm, if I don't, if I don't enjoy what I'm doing, if I don't learn something new every day, why am I doing that? Also, the corporate politics had become unbearable for my standards because being promoted means being paid more, having more responsibility, running more risks in my case, but also being exposed to an increasingly annoying amount of corporate politics, which is it's just part of the game. So if you're not prepared for that, do not even uh, you know, aim at having a certain position which starts with a C. In my case, was the chief investment office. Anything that starts with a C in front, no, I'm, I'm kidding. But, you know, it involves a lot of, um, of politics, corporate politics. And at some point, this corporate politics was overshadowing even the content of my work. And then I basically, you know, on a parallel fashion, I started writing on LinkedIn and opening the newsletter. This was like, beginning of 2021, just a side gig for fun. And I soon realized that, wow, that was really fun. You know, the interaction with people, thinking how to build it up, how to communicate what I knew, uh, interacting, uh, writing, thinking how to write in, in, in such a way that I can convey what I want to convey to people. I mean, I thought, okay, well, this is fun. And then at some point I thought this is fun and also potentially something I can do for a living. So why not? And I took the leap of faith, basically, and I quit. And um, my wife wanted to kill me. And my best friends thought I was completely crazy. Uh, but um, you know, having this sort of conversations with you, Anthony, was obviously much more difficult before because of compliance. ING can't check what I'm saying in public. Um, ING wants to check, ING or any other employer wants to check uh, what uh, I, take, I, I write on LinkedIn, what I write on the, on the macro compass. At some point, I thought, I don't want anybody to check what I'm doing. I just want to put it out for, you know, to, to educate and put out the knowledge that I had accumulated over the past years. And 
as people seem to like what I have to say, then let's give it a try. And I now say this very lightly, but let's give it a try meant um, basically giving away a pretty decent salary uh, or the certainty of receiving that salary uh, and also leaving behind um, uh, the label. The label was that I am known in the street to be basically the youngest ever guy to manage such a large portfolio that any guy has seen on the street. Street is the name for uh, investment banks. And so, you know, I was, I had this label with me and it was a comfortable one. And I'm like, okay, I'm that guy, young, brilliant, apparently everybody likes him, uh, uh, now can even communicate, runs a huge book and basically removing that label and saying, I don't run that book anymore. I don't have that title anymore. It's just me, me putting out the content. And if you like it, it's going to be a success. If you don't, I'm an idiot. And that part was, and that part was tough, but here we are. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure the communication skills came in handy with managing your wife's expectations. Yes, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but no, I mean, absolutely credit to you for, for staying true to those values of always be learning and progression. So yeah, we wish you the very best with this, this new kind of turn in your career. And I'm sure it's just the beginning of the next, the next kind of chapter. Um, but look, moving to the, the next part, which yeah. was, you obviously now, I mean, when I read your LinkedIn posts or things like that, I think they're brilliant because they hit just the right tone and it takes things, deconstructs them and makes them much more digestible. And I think that's perfect for what we do, which is yeah. try and you know, finance students, I think, sometimes can be a bit intimidated by a lot of the subject matter because mm. there's such a big division between the technical side and the application, as we said earlier, what they actually do day to day in markets. So what advice can you give to them to, from a top level, I guess, mm. all of this stuff in the world's going on all of the time, because they're, I mean, when I started my career in 2006, if you can believe it, I actually used to still have to go to the newspaper truck <laughs> at 6am in the morning and get every new conceivable newspaper I could. We, the analysts had to read them. Yeah. Whereas now, obviously, students are just subjected to an overwhelming amount of information 24-7. How's best then for a student wanting to get into finance who needs to build up that repertoire of commercial awareness so they can talk markets as well as technically know about them? What advice would you give in that area? So... The opportunity today is huge compared to 15 years ago, and you're right. So if you are on LinkedIn or on Twitter or on Substack or wherever you get your information now, you can get as much as you want. So normally I would say just scout for good quality stuff and then make sure you consistently read those. So it needs to be a routine. For instance, do you find the Financial Times to be a good resource? All right, then make sure that it's within your five to seven. Do not exaggerate and do not overwhelm you with information. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to digest it, right? So we also live in the world of uh, having, to, having a very low attention span compared to maybe 20 years ago because of the social media influence in our life. So make sure as well that your time is well spent, efficiently spent, which means that the message and information you get is pretty concise, clear, and factual, importantly factual. And nowadays, I mean, in the past, you had to go through uh, uh, newspapers to do that. And nowadays, you have several other free sources of information. It's important, though, to make a first selection. So spend time on identifying who are the guys that you really trust and want to read or, or the newspapers, and then make sure you always read those. And then continuously over time, continue to scout to open your horizons and you know, sooner or later, you're going to find somebody else that you find consistently interesting and factual and start following this guy too. And then you create basically a package. That's what I do for myself. Still today, I, I read five sources a day, three are newsletters, two are newspapers. And that's it. That's what I go through every week, depending on, you know, the um, basically the, the time horizon of, of publishing of these newspapers or newsletters. And then, of course, I read also something on top of that otherwise you, you close yourself in an echo chamber mm. uh, but that's that's probably the most efficient way to go through it mm. uh, how do you find um and i guess this kind of brings back a little bit of what you were doing at ing but how do you find the disconnect then out of 
trying to move up. I mean, I've always found markets almost like a drug yeah. <laughs> because it's because it is pretty much permanent apart from Saturday, somewhere in the world is open. Yeah. Something is happening and you kind of get a bit of a kick, or at least I used to out of being the first to know yeah. the first, when something breaks, you're like, I want to be first. And that's as an analyst, not even as a trader trying to execute. Yes. So what was your kind of method? Because I know for students as well, mental health for young people, particularly amplified by the pandemic is, is a really important thing. And so how can they kind of manage that? Because I know markets can be quite all absorbing, particularly because a lot of them are trading crypto and there really is no let up there. <laughs> so uh -huh. if I know something and you know something, Anthony, there is for sure somebody else in the world that knows it before you and I know. That's a fact. So uh, applying a news-based strategy to your trading approach is basically today only applicable with algo trading and only by few professional flow traders all over the world. And most likely, credibly, you can't be amongst those, which means having that approach is you know, very time consuming, very mental energy consuming, probably not efficient too. That's what I would say, based on, on a single news to be able to be the first one to know and therefore the first one to be able to profit from that. It's not a business model that a, a single person without infrastructure can actually deliver. So in general, then, uh, the advice that I can give to people, again, is to make sure that if you are in markets, you're really passionate about it because it is a, a fast-paced, um, somehow energy-draining business. The, but at the same time, uh, be credible with yourself and humble about it. So it's a very difficult business, as in to be profitable is a very difficult business. And very few people actually succeed in that, which means that you, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to like it and be passionate about it and uh, discount the probability that you will never be able to solve the puzzle in your entire life and find the motivation into trying to get closer and closer. And that's how you remain healthy about it. Because if you are true to yourself and you know that the highest probability outcome is that you will not be able to solve the puzzle at all, and you will only get closer and closer and smarter and smarter over time, if you are consistent with that view, then it's, it's more likely as well, you will not overwhelm yourself with countless hours and pressure because you just find it unnecessary. It's a bit like, I am one of the few guys on Twitter or on my, on my uh, newsletter, The Macro Compass, that puts out investment ideas or training ideas to the world, open face, with an entry point, a stop loss, and a first profit target. And people are telling me, you're absolutely nuts because people will be able to see when you're wrong. Um, <laughs> and, 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 what's, and what's the problem? I mean, everybody is wrong. So this is the first step in admitting to yourself that you will never be able to achieve a 100% win rate. It's impossible. It's humanly impossible. The best trader uh, that compounded the best returns over the last 30 years is Jim Simons of Renaissance Capital. And Jim Simons, there is a, I mean, an amazing book about him being written, by the way. Um, just Google it. I don't remember the name. Jim Simons is the trader, Renaissance Macro. Um, and he's a mathematician that developed a quant-based approach that is completely uh, systematic. Anthony has no discretionary decision-making, zero. Basically, the computers run the long-short position for him, not himself. Guess what his win rate is on trades? It's going to be something insanely high, by the, by the way, that this is being pitched. Or is it the complete opposite, and it's just literally 1.1 1. 1 over the edge? There are good volume. there are good answers in the chat. I can see it's fifty one percent. Fifty one percent. The best traders of all time who compounded about thirty percent annual return for thirty years in a row, or something like that, the huge returns, is right one trade and is wrong the other trade, and then is right one trade and then is wrong the other trade. The best traders of all time do that. Friends in hedge funds. When I was at ING, my win rate was 54%. So like, oh, you're going to be wrong. Sure, of course. Oh, plenty of times I'm going to be wrong. And I don't see the problem with it. So this really helps um, 
being true to yourself relieves yourself from the pressure. But to get to, the, to that intellectual honesty, it's a very demanding step because this industry teaches big ego. It promotes big ego and big ego is your worst enemy if you're managing money. Is it, from the other PMs that you know and that you've met, um, did, um, that big ego, do they, have they all got over that part and that's why they are successful? Or is it a complete mixed bag of personalities? It's a mixed bag of personalities. And yeah. uh, there is a common trait amongst the most successful market makers, um, portfolio managers, hedge fund portfolio managers. Those are all different jobs and animals. The common trait amongst the top 10% percentile of the most successful guys is that they went over this step. And they, they all did. It doesn't mean that there are, there are successful guys that I know that never went over this step, which is, which is just fine. I'm just saying if you want to skew your, the odds your way to do this in a mentally healthy way and also potentially in a profitable way, this is a step that skews the odds in your favor. It, it's not a necessary and sufficient condition, but it skews the odds your way. Okay, cool. Well, look, let's, let's move on to some questions. Yeah. So, sure. yeah, hit us up in the chat or the Q&A. If you have a question for, for Alf you'd like to know, just drop it in and I can see them all and I'll, I'll present them. So, okay, I'll read out the first one while others type theirs in. So, Pal has asked, do you think it is necessary to specialize into the area that you like most in order to succeed on the highest level? Or do you think it'd be more appropriate to a person who loves multiple areas of finance and markets to keep expanding into different areas? It's quite a question. Um, may I ask, Anthony, just for one thing before we start? Um, I am um, having this conversation is really great, to be honest. I mean, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, and it also, I hope, helps the people listening to this webinar. Um, if there is one thing you guys could do to help me out is to subscribe to the newsletter. It's free. So if you just want to do it, I'll, I'd be you know, super happy to, um, to see that, that going on. Now, back to the question. Um, basically, I, I also to Paul, right? Paul was the name of the guy. Yeah. And, and so, Paul, I, I started back then uh, wanting to specialize and to become a um, sort of quantitative portfolio manager. So I thought I could build models that gave me an edge um, to basically overperform markets. And soon after starting, I realized that that's quite a niche and that it's much better to develop broader skills. So I ended up becoming a macro discretionary portfolio manager, which means I still use models to run my portfolio, but I use them not as my main input. So they, they speed out signals. For instance, I have several indices that I build and then they say, okay, this is overvalued or undervalued. I take that input and I put it in the old macro view that I have of the world, and I see where it stands, and then I make a discretionary decision whether to be long or short something. So I turn basically 180 degrees. And so what this taught me is that while at the beginning I thought that what I really wanted to specialize was one thing, well, at the end, it was not. So my suggestion would always be to follow your passion. If you, if you really like something, pursue it, but keep an open mind to develop skills that can help you to pivot away because in a couple of years, you might, you know, you might, you don't know exactly if that is, is really what you want. Cool. And I've, I've shared the link there for, for our newsletter. So please, Thanks. please do. It's highly recommended. Um, another good question, a very, I guess, on topic of, of the here and now is Web3. There's, there's yeah. lots of chatter about mm -hmm. it, I guess, a bit of a lack of probably education about what exactly that is, because I think people look at something like Meta and think, well, here it is, we've arrived. But obviously that's, this is the first kind of more broad based awareness mm -hmm. of something that's been happening for a while. But yeah. what is your take about this whole web three, web two to three transition? Yeah. So the other thing that I learned uh, in my experience is that, when I don't know something, I'm going to say, I don't know. So I know little about uh, Web 3.0. And the reason why I say that is that I haven't tried myself one of the features it allows in a deep enough way to be able to give you an opinion. What I can say is more general about the, the digital transition 
And so yesterday I was reading a piece from Goldman Sachs about the gaming industry. So, and, and they project something like 500 million gaming users growth a year over the next few years, right? So all these guys are going to use uh, 3D Google goggles or whatever other highly digital instrument that 20 years ago was just a dream, right? So what this teaches me is that the economy is becoming more and more digital. I am now in the process of, you know, uh, setting up uh, my own business and I could never th- uh, would have never thought of doing that five years ago completely remote I mean it, it, it was it was a, a stretch nowadays it's not so what that teaches me is that the direction of travel seems to be pretty clear and the digitalization of the world is likely to continue uh, whether web 3.0 will be the um, overwhelming reality in five years from now, Anthony, I just don't have the, the, the insights to, to give a proper answer. Was there any PMs that were talking about crypto in terms of as an asset class? I know it's, there's been ETF launches from ProShares and lots so, of others. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So, so uh, we talk about egos, right? And uh, the bankers are, have, have big egos, normally speaking, and portfolio managers too. So digital assets are seen as a Ponzi scheme. That's the average um, answer, which I strongly disagree with. Um, but it's hard for the average banker to change its mind. Uh, first of all, they see it as a threat. Um, and ultimately, it could be a threat. Um because it somehow also forces central banks to react to it, which then means central bank digital currencies might become a reality faster than expected, which also has impact on monetary policy, which ultimately has impacts on commercial banks. So all in all, people within the industry, Andrew, want to preserve the status quo, especially at a banker's level. And anything that, that comes and it's new and it's potentially threatening, it's disliked by definition. There are some portfolio managers out there that I know that have a sympathy for digital asset classes none of these guys is a maximalist which i really like which means they either say oh it's going to zero it's a ponzi scheme or tomorrow we're gonna buy bananas in bitcoin and the bananas in euro you can't buy them anymore it's only bitcoin so those two extremes are polarizing the discussion and i think the smart guys are seeing digital assets uh, basically as a call option that's the way I interpret it. It's, it's, a, it's an asset you want to own uh, in a size that you can uh, afford in terms of drawdowns and volatility that it generates for your portfolio, but it's an asset that you can't ignore at the same time because of the potential positive payoff it can have in the future. And that's the, the role it has in my portfolio. I, I allocate a small percentage of my wealth in digital assets because I think there might be a pretty good convex payoff my way. And at the same time, I touch it, I treat it as a call option where if I'm completely wrong and the far, you know, the far left tail scenario realizes, then I'm going to lose the premium on the call option, which is the small amount I invested my wealth in. And I'm not going to treat it as, as an ego trade. It's either right or wrong. It's an asset class. It must have a role in the portfolio, which is appropriate to its characteristics. Yeah. No, really good, really good summary. And um, Robin has asked, did you have a specific process or way to improve your communication and yeah. politics skills? Yes, I had. <laughs> Find a mentor. And the mentor has two characteristics. He has uh, gray hair or no hair. No, I'm just kidding. He's, he's very <laughs> experienced. He's very experienced, which means he's at the phase of the career where he went up, up, and up. And then he has been plateauing for five to seven years, maybe 10 years, which means he, he, he has gone through the phase where he was growing. So he, he also went through the phase where he was plateauing, where he found it hard to progress, which is most likely not because he lacked skills, but because he was lacking technical skills, but because he was lacking other skills that he didn't want to develop because maybe they didn't match his profile, which means often the diplomatic skills and communication skills. And this guy has gone through exactly the crap that you will hate the most, and he can tell you how that's, that, that's going to play out. And the second most important characteristic of a mentor is that he can tell straight to your face 
what's going to happen even if you don't like it. So you don't have to find somebody who massages you or promotes you in all situations. You have to find somebody who has been there and has no problem telling you you're going to make a huge mistake for your career, which doesn't mean you're still going to do it because sometimes, you know, we're stubborn and we go for it, but you really need somebody who these two characteristics. My mentor was a guy that, I mean, from a content perspective, he's, he's, <laughs> he's really great. He communicates well. He does horrible politics and he knows it. He's just like, I don't want to, I don't want to meddle in that stuff. I don't care. I don't want to, I don't want to lie. I don't want to massage things to my risk managers. I'm just going to say, if I see risks, I'm going to say, this is risky. Even if it goes against my own self-interest, which obviously cups his career by definition, because that's how it works. And he was a, a, a great teacher uh, to basically, because he could anticipate already what happened what would have happened and then you know you can sort of um yeah so how can i say uh, maneuver around that and learn how to handle these situations much better if you have a mentor with these two characteristics okay we'll we'll, we'll take one final question um from someone in hong kong hmm. and they've asked um would you share about how to learn macro starting out as a junior and i'm going to add another angle on that because a lot of the students who we, we actually try to target to, to take part in some of our practical simulations are non-econ students. So those from a variety of different backgrounds, because our belief has always been, you know, there could be talent out there that's just, you know, in a very much more process-driven, like a sales trading role, for example, there could be someone who's just got talent who yeah. might be a music or a history student or something like that. The question they always ask is, well, how do I kind of accelerate what I do need to learn because I haven't learned it at university. So any kind of kind of ground rules or competencies yes. to get the macro up and running? First of all, you need to understand what money is. Quite a weird statement, but the Keynesian and post-Keynesian stuff we are taught at universities um, comes from wrong foundations and wrong definitions of money. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have one magic book that can sort of answer all these questions at one because money is one. You need to write a book, Hal. <laughs> I know, and you're not you're not the first one who tells me that, Anthony. So uh, I, I'm gonna get to it, I promise. But um, Robin is correct. Central Banking 101 from uh, Joseph Wang, friend of mine on Twitter, is called the Fed Guy. I think is his handle. He used to work at the Fed. Um, he explains. Um, money plumbing as i call it so the central bank um, and the commercial bank system very well when you want to understand first money rather than money plumbing then you read cullen Roche book which is called pragmatic capitalism i'm going to interview cullen for real vision today or tomorrow anyway um i'll uh, i'll see if i can share a link which goes behind the paywall if you promise not to share that link on social media guys otherwise guys at Real Vision are going to kill me. So, uh, But for, I'm going to talk money with Cullen Roche. Buy his book. It's called Pragmatic Capitalism. 100 pages, maybe. He explains very well how money works. You start from there. Then you move to money plumbing. So central banking and commercial banking. Central Banking 101 from Joseph Wang. It's a very good book. And then you start connecting the dots. And to connect the dots, I suggest that you read the book of Richard Koo. There are two books. One is called Balance Sheet Recessions, which explains what happened in Japan where they try to experiment with expanding credit at a very fast pace and lowering interest rates at the same time. And there is another um, a book, which is called The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics, which is a pretty good title, from Richard Koo again. Finally, you should read the work of Professor Steve Keen, K-E-E-N. He's an Australian professor uh, who does an amazing job at explaining macro. Those are the four to five pillars. You start from that and you have a good understanding. Unfortunately, there is nobody who then does a, you know, a holistic job connecting all of that together. I'm going to write my book and uh, let's see if I can do that. <laughs> I think that's a good way to, to end the discussion. And what I'll do is I will get links to all of those books that were mentioned. And when we share this video, 
Um, and what I plan to do is also take the audio and put it out as a podcast. I'll put all of the links there, yeah, um, including to the Macro Compass as well. So, yeah, Alf, that was amazing. It's um, yeah, some fantastic insight. I think really honest, which is so refreshing for the community to hear. And so, yeah, can't thank you enough. And I'm sure for everyone listening, connect. Remember, Alf himself said networking. And yeah. so here's an experienced person. You've heard him talk now and you have a reason to connect. So encourage you to do so. And uh, yeah, look forward to look forward to the book, Alf. <laughs> oh, well, that's going to take some time. Uh, but guys, uh, I really appreciate having... Uh, almost 100 people, I think, listening to this. Uh, a few years ago, I was one of you. And uh, career went fast, but uh, I'm still super approachable. So if you have questions or whatever, you find me on LinkedIn uh, with my full Italian, Southern Italian sounding name, or on Twitter at MacroAlf, or you want to send me a, an email via the Macro Compass newsletter, just do so. I'm super approachable. Uh, time is a bit of a constraint, but I always find time to answer to students, especially to students. So just do that. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Alf. And thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. See you next time.